You're listening to Chameleon Church. Biblical antidotes for the modern man. With your host, Alan Aguirre. Good morning, good morning, Alan Aguirre, the host of your Chameleon Church show, coming to you live and direct. From the Wasatch back of of northern Utah. Good morning. How are you? Good to see all y'all. Um so so forty four years ago I was playing guitar. I had a punk rock band. We didn't really have a name. It was it was like a new thing we were doing. We had my friend and I, who was my age as well, I was fifteen. Uh we had left a band called the Scientists. Um they were a bit of a punk rock band back then you know they, nothing really happened to them but what's what's really interesting is the bass player um lived in Toluca Lake which was kind of like the Hollywood that's where all the celebrities lived uh Toluca Lake's pretty much part of Burbank but um and he lived in Toluca Lake. the story was that the Beverly Hillbillies was based on his family that they had come to to you know Hollywood to LA and because they had made it rich in oil wherever they were from and he, he pretty much lived in a mansion in toluca lake and that's where we would rehearse so it was it was him on bass a guy named steve death on vocals my buddy on drums raymond and he's the one that got me and brought me into the band on guitar i had just received a guitar from my grandfather he had given me a guitar electric guitar so i had a little amp and a little guitar had that old school sound to it and I, you know, it didn't last very long. The Jeff, Jeff kind of like was a little threatened by my ability, because uh, he was older. I mean, Jeff and Steve, they were in their twenties, and that that was the diff that was the difficult part for the most part, being a teenager playing with grown adults. And um, but anyway, so we had a little band, uh, Raymond and I. I had written a couple of songs. We were ha hammering them out, and um, I showed a story about we were practicing in his. But he lived in in an apartment complex with his mom and his sister. So we were practicing in the garage that they had in this in this complex apartment complex in Burbank. And uh, his sister was in her twenties, so that's how we would get our rides to and from Hollywood. Was her and her friends? Because, like I said, we were fifteen, and um, we um, she worked at Licorice Pizza in Hollywood, and that was a hot spot back in the in the seventies uh for this you know music scene that was blowing up called punk rock and her best friend roxanne worked with her at licorice pizza and don bowles the drummer for the germs who was also in 45 graves um this is like a few months before the decline of western civilization was filmed the documentary on the los angeles punk scene don bowles liked roxanne so he was over at the apartment that night and he opened up the garage door and there's don and because we were you know raymond and i were practicing uh he looked around real quick and he was like you don't have a bass player i go no he goes can i come can i you know i'll be over tomorrow with a case of beer and and a bass guitar if that's all right i'm like yeah sure and uh and then he shut the door and we were like there's no way that's going to happen don bowls from the germs he's a this is a bona fide you know rock star already let me put it this way two the ger two members of the germs are in the rock and roll hall of fame the original drummer belinda carlisle from the go-go's and pat smear the guitarist for the germs you 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 would have heard of him in uh what you would call it um nirvana and then foo fighters well through foo fighters pat smear got in the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So two members of that band are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is mind blowing in and of itself. So Don shows up. We didn't think he would, but he did. He showed up, and we hammered out these two songs. He brought a mic and a bass guitar, and we recorded them. I had I, I, when I showed up. Anyway, I had the recording, but I don't have it anymore. But it was two songs. Babies are just babies, and uh, that's that's one of them. And I forgot what the other one was. I, I remember that much. I tell you all this because obviously something was about to happen to my music career um, because at, back in those days, all you had to do was walk in, you know, if you could get this recording walked into K-Rock, Rodney Bingenheimer would play it, 
that's it. The rest is history. And since we already had Don in the picture, he was going to walk it in. And I'm convinced that something was going to happen because of what happened to me. Here's Lenny Parada, my old pastor and my old friend and Chris Rosentrader, the uh, co-host of the Community Church Show. How are you guys doing this morning? Morning. Good morning. Good morning. So my parents already couldn't manage me. I was 15 years old, sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know, sneaking out at night, going to Hollywood, playing and, you know, checking out the club scene, watching bands, playing in my bands. They didn't know what to do with me. They, they couldn't manage me. And so now this was happening, and I was excited about it because I knew this was going to happen. So they decided to... Uh, they decided to, to, my grandfather was the one they, that decided, well, they decided that, that through my grandfather, because I, I, I honored and I respected my grandfather, I loved my grandfather, had a great relationship with my grandfather. He decided that um, to tell, to come up, he, this was his idea. Let's tell Alan that his uncle, who's a Christian missionary in Central America, his, his church does television. And let's, Let's, let's convince him. I'll convince him to go down there for four months to do television, uh, his music on TV, so that he could put it on his resume. Now, did I know I was being conned? Did I know I was being scammed while it was happening? Yeah. <laughs> I did, but I had to get on that plane. I had an encounter with something. I left, so the night before I, jumped, I got on that plane, I had an encounter with what I would eventually find out was the holy spirit i didn't i was i had i wasn't a person of faith i didn't have any i wasn't a christian i didn't come from a christian background at all in any way shape or form and i had an encounter with the holy spirit that night and it it, it shook me up um it shook me up because it was my first tan, real tangible experience with well, for example, I believe in the spiritual realm. I knew there was a spiritual realm. And so if there was a positive spiritual realm, like this thing called God and Jesus, I knew that much. Then there had, you know, if no, if there was a negative spiritual realm, like the devil and demons and all that, which I knew existed, then there had to be a positive realm. And I knew about God and I knew about Jesus. But that's as far as they all went. And I, and I dabbled and experimented and, Remember Pyramid Power back then, Lenny? I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, yeah. I dabbled in that, you know, and what kel 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 kinetic moving crap. You know, I mean, the stupid stuff you do, and then drugs doesn't help and all that. But I, so I was a bit of a spiritualist, but I, I wasn't in a cult. I didn't pray to the devil. I didn't pray to God. I didn't pray. I, I, I literally had no faith profile, but I knew this stuff existed, and... So the fact that I had this encounter with something that, so this was my first like interaction with the spiritual realm to a degree that it, that it was tangible, not just this idea or concept or philosophy. This was like something really happened to me and it, and it freaked me out a little bit. Oh, it freaked me out because of, it was an amazing feeling. It was an amazing presence. It was an amazing interaction. But as soon as I reasoned with my practical physical mind that what was going that that I was that they, there, there was no way oh, let me just tell you what happened um, I could I knew I was being conned I knew they were they were up to something I knew it and and but even though I knew it I knew I had to jump on that plane I knew I just uh, you know I, I had to jump on that plane and then I had this crazy thought. Because, you know, I was convinced that I was smarter than everybody. Still am. Um, but I've proven that. I pro I've proven that I am. Time tells all, right? I was convinced that I was smarter than all these people and that they were conning me. And they were. It's, it's not that I was wrong. But it was, it, that wasn't the issue. The issue was I needed to learn something. It's like Joseph, right? He knew he was going to be bowed down to by his brothers, but he jumped the gun by telling his, these dreams, right? And it got him in trouble. But it would eventually happen. Same kind of idea. I knew I was smarter than these people, and I knew that, it, and I knew I was being conned. And so, as I sat there contemplating my what I was about to do, 
even though I knew I shouldn't do it because I knew they were lying to me. I was in, I was in, it was like, think of, a, of an aquarium. And I was in the middle, I, and I found myself in the middle of that aquarium full of water. And I was like surrounded by water behind me, underneath me, above me to all my, you know, and I'm like, and that pressure of being in that aquarium with the, it was the Holy Spirit just engulfed. I was engulfed by the Holy Spirit. And I was like, oh my God, what is, what is this? I knew it was, I knew it was supernatural. I knew it was spiritual. And I just kind of sat there on my bed, you know, engulfed in this thing. And then as soon as I, as soon as the thought of them being smarter than me, then maybe I, the, here's the actual question I had. Maybe I don't have it all together like I think I do. That's what prompted the spirit. But as soon as I said, no, that's not possible, it left like a scaredy cat, you know? So that was a, once I realized what was going on later on, I, that was a, a, a big pivoting point because of the, the methodology, the, the layers involved with maybe I don't have it all together. Maybe I don't really know what's going on. And the thought of, of no, that's not possible. And, 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 that, and, and what that means and how that works with the substance of, you know, God's spirit. And man, I've never forgotten that lesson. Okay, so 44 years ago, it was a Sunday. Today, 44 years ago was a Wednesday, January 23rd. On Sunday night, I, I got on that plane. And I had, I was, I had, we had a couple going away parties for me with my friends and stuff. And that was, you know, about as godless as it can get. And um, so I literally got on a plane hours after being, you know, sexually active and on drugs. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that not as a boast, but just I'm trying to give you an example of the person that got on that plane. Uh, a, a very godless, a very demonic, a very uh, lost little boy. And uh, I remember it was rainy when I got to the, when I, when I landed in Guatemala City. It was rainy. My uncle and my aunt picked me up. Very little was discussed. That we didn't, there wasn't a lot of talking. And I, I would find out later why. My uncle had told them, he knew that they were going to lie. To, he knew that they were lying to me, and he told him, "Don't send him. One, don't send him here. It's not my problem. It's your problem. Don't send him." And then they would convince. They kept calling and talking to him. And then they told. So he told him, "Look, if you're going to send him, you got to tell him the truth. Don't send him here with a lie." So they didn't want to deal with it because it's not their. It wasn't for them to deal. I fully understand that. It's not on them. Um, and then two, they never told me the truth. So. I'm on, I'm in, but they didn't know that. They weren't sure, and they weren't bringing it up, right? I mean, how, how do you tell a 15-year-old kid he's just been bamboozled by his entire family, and he's, on, and he's got a one-way ticket, and, and uh, he's got nowhere else to go because they're, they're not going to let him come back? Yeah, that's pretty screwed up. Um, they didn't talk very much. We didn't talk very much. We got to the house. Um, my cousin is two and a half years younger than I am, so he had turned 13 in October. This is January. And uh, which is, I, when I thought about that this morning, it freaked me out because that's my grandson's age. That ah, kind of freaked me out a little bit. Um, and uh, it was it was pretty sobering. Everything, everyone was really kind of like, this is this is this is really kind of weird. I just walked into my uncle's life, his family. I, I only saw this guy on a, a couple times a year, maybe when he'd come up to the states. The last time I had spent any significant time with him with him was when I was seven, when I lived with them for about six weeks in Corvallis, Oregon. So everyone's a little, a little awkward. And plus, they're Christians, and they're like hardcore Christians, and I'm not a Christian. So it's like, there's this like, you know. Anyway, Monday morning, I woke up and um, went outside. They're in front of their house. So I'm going to use the word development, but that's really not a good word for it. But in the development that they lived in, it was Utatlan Dos and Zone 11. That's the name of the development behind um, behind uh, the supermarket. Anyway, it's development. There was a park in the middle of, of where we lived and in the soccer field, and we lived across the street from the park. So I'm, uh, I got up early. I'm, I'm outside Monday morning. My cousin's getting ready to go to school, 
to a, to a Christian. To, he, he goes to a private school for American missionary kids. I'm not going to go um, for some reason. I'm going to go with my uncle to, to work, to the church offices. And so I'm outside of the house on the park. Uh, I'm smoking a cigarette. And a car comes down the street, and he goes, oh, hide it. Hide the cigarette because it was full of kids from, that are on their way to school. And I didn't know Christina was in that car, and she saw us. <laughs> um, so I kind of hit it. I'm like, well, that's why. Why am I going to hide a cigarette from kids from your school? I, I, it's not a, I don't care if they know that I smoke. I mean, I, I smoke. So anyway, so I did, so for Monday and Tuesday, I went to the church offices with my uncle, and he and, and he was in meetings and all that. They had a they had there was a ministry a ministry from San Diego called Peculiar People. I can't remember the guy's name, or I don't know anything about him. I don't even know if they're still around, but they were my uncle's church was hosting them, and it was a worship. I mean, it was a healing ministry, and so they had they were hosting it. They brought him in. And they're going. They're 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 having meetings around downtown Guatemala, around you know the capital, where the, where they're going to preach, and this guy's going to unleash healing on people. They're going to line up people. They're going to pray for people, and and um, so he was. You know, my uncle was busy, and so there was a the church offices. It was a pretty big, pretty big. It was like an old mansion type of thing, and there was a couple, two or three single sisters that lived in the building. Uh, even though they, they had a community outside of the city, a commune outside of the city, and some of them lived there too. And so this was like the main central hub of the, of the ministry in the city. And so I, I was basically shuffled off to deal with the, to, to be, you know, be stewarded by these women. Uh, Gladys, Guatemalan woman, Guatemalan lady named Gladys, who was married to one of the American missionaries guys, uh, Dick Fennell who um, was of the original team from Northern California that, was, that went down there in 1977 with my uncle. Um, my uncle was the presiding elder of this church. So I, I, I was hanging out with Gladys uh, Ligia, who's a Guatemalan girl who's from the streets and all that, uh, who ended up marrying a, a Nicaraguan brother. I, I'm still in contact with them today online. Uh, Gladys and Dick, been in contact with them a long time. I actually got the... the, the, the I actually... We've we've interacted with Dick and Gladys since I've been married and with children, and I've actually have seen Gladys mess with Corin, my son, the way she used to mess with me in Guatemala. She's a she's a jokester. She's awesome. I love Dick and Dick and Gladys, and um, um, another Lulu, uh, another lady who was I don't know if she was from Guatemala or not. I think she was American. Anyway, so they would take me out to lunch. Oh, and Valerie Bouvier, who was who had ended up becoming Valerie Valerie Sabella, she was one of the musicians. Uh, in, in the worship band, and they would take us, take me to lunch, and they would they would mess with me, and they would tease me and stuff because of my manetta de said, my style, my my clothing style, and musical taste, and all that. They were they were they were messing with me, but they could, you know, they, and they knew they could. So, the first two days were spent hanging out at the offices. I am totally discombobulated. I am totally, I am like a total fish out of water. But here's what, here's but here's what I haven't told you yet. On Monday morning, when I was outside smoking that cigarette with my cousin, like hours after I got there, I looked at him and I said, "There's no TV thing going on here." Is there? He looked at me with a little bit of a shock, and he's like, "No, what are you talking about?" I'm like, "No, it's all right. I, I, I didn't think so." So I knew, like I said, I already knew I was being conned, but I had to get on that plane. So come Wednesday, the 23rd of January. Three days later, I'm going to be enrolled into school. So my my cousin, you know, he went to school on Monday. He went to school on Tuesday. He went to school on Wednesday. I was going to go there a couple hours later. I mean, I'm being treated. It's like I'm being treated like the plague or something. Um, and um, they're going to take. He's going to take me in a little after, and we're going to have a meeting with the the principal, who was an American man. Um, and so I am introduced to him, and then I'm introduced to Ken Sabella who uh, is not only the music teacher of the school, but he's the worship leader guy at my uncle's church, an American. Highly talented. Uh, very, very, I mean, this guy he could literally play any instrument, read music, the whole nine yards. He was, he was a literal, you know, an actual hippie from the 70s, kind of like, you know, anyway. He would become my first 
mentor when it came to worship music um, in my life, Ken Sabella. I met him Wednesday morning. For some reason, their excuse was, I don't, it was a lame excuse, but they, instead of sit, having me, because I had to take tests, because you got to remember, school for me in Los Angeles was not about education. It was not about learning. It was about posturing. It was about posing. It was, it's where you scored your girl, your girlfriends. It's where you scored chicks and where you scored drugs and where you basically peacock. It had nothing to do with education in any way, shape, or form. So I was going like, to have to ask Just like today. Some, right? <laughs> yeah. so, I, so I was actually going to have to do some tests that I had skipped out of while I was still in L.A. because, well, I wasn't very academic. Um, and I was, you know, I was obviously failing classes and stuff because I... Uh, School, like I said, was not something I was, you know, I didn't do school. Um, I didn't do sports. You know, I, 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 I did as little as I, as, as, as I could to, to, you know, whatever. So I had to take some tests and all that. But they decided, so the school is less than 100 students, kindergarten to, to 12th grade. All the junior high and high school kids, how many, however many of them were, there, there were, we're in a bungalow at the top of the, of the property. And in the main building where, where the offices and all that was the uh, elementary. And they sat me with third graders. I don't know why. They, they, one of the reasons they said was, oh, they didn't have room for me upstairs or whatever. They, they had to make room for me. But I heard, I had also had heard that the reason why they did that was so I wouldn't disrupt or be a bad influence on, the, on my peer group because you know third graders are going to be able to handle it. It's just, welcome to Christianity. This is my first introduction to Christianity. Not too bright. Not very bright. It was really kind of weird. So I'm sitting there literally sitting there with third graders. And uh, uh, I wanted a cigarette. Uh, you can't leave the school grounds because we're Americans and this was a very um, a very volatile period in the history of Central America when it came to uh, insurgents, guerrilla warfare, Nicaragua had fallen, El Salvador was on the way, and tomorrow Guatemala. That was literally the graffiti battle cry of the communist Marxist insurgents that were in the area in Central America in the early 80s. And because we're Americans, it were, were an easy target, so we, I couldn't leave the, the grounds. There was no way I was going to be able to smoke. Uh, I was dying for a cigarette. Um, I'm hanging out with third grade, th you know, what are, what are the eight-year-olds? Eight it was just kind of, it was just absolutely bizarre, absolutely bizarre. Well, in order to get to the, and the, the main restrooms were in that building. And so what was, what was happening, so I remember, so we had a, there was like a recess break. And I was with my cousin and, and I'm, I'm basically, you're on display. Sorry, horrendous disc, Daniel Amos. Um, I'm basically, you know, an oddity. Um, the, the, the weird kid from Los Angeles, Eric's cousin, uh, he's in a band, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, I'm, these are Christian missionary kids in a third world. It's like, it's, it's worse than American youth group kids because we're in the third world. They literally don't have a reference either to what's, you know, to Christianity. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, like an, I'm like on display. I'm like an, And uh, that that was that was weird, that was very weird. And so, in order to get to get to the restroom, you had to walk by me. So they're all raising their their little hand. Well, it was it was a uh, was it pace? Is it called pace? Um, the the Christian system that we went to school, where you had to raise a little flag to get. Yeah, that's an old ace. Was it ace? I forgot what it was, but anyway. So they would they would raise their little hand so they could go to the bathroom so they could walk by the freak and get a get a get a good look at him. That was happening a lot. And um, and right before lunch break, this girl needed to go to the restroom, and so she came down to see the freak. And um, I was sitting there and I saw, I heard her coming, so I looked, and I looked up and there's this girl. I remember my thoughts were, she looked, she looked so pure. She looked so clean. I remember those were the words that I thought of. 
So I'm from L.A. From L.A. in the 70s. Girls were different. Um, this is this girl. And she looked at me and she smiled. She said, hello. And uh, I remember saying to myself, get a grip, man. <laughs> but it was the Lord, you know. So I met my first my, my first Christian music mentor in, in the morning. I met my wife-to-be before lunch. And uh, so that night, this ministry that my uncle had brought in was going to be ministering in a Zone 1, downtown Guatemala City. It's, this is like, this was really a rough area. This is like, this is bad. Uh, a lot of the poverty and just the, the crime and poverty. I mean, this is rough and um so it's gonna be in zone one so my uncle was like hey why don't you bring your guitar why don't you why don't you join me tonight at this uh meeting and bring your guitar and I sit in with the band i had brought my 12 string guitar with me you know you, you don't uh you don't invite non-believers to sit in on worship at, you know, uh, at a conference with a, with a with, you know you don't do that but he was smarter than most uh, he was actually an, an apostle. So anyway, I went with I went and I sat in with the band. I, there, there's 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 uh, there's Ken that I had met that morning. Uh, there's Valerie that I had met during the week, and I was introduced to these other musicians. You know, half of them were Americans because this is a missionary. You know, American missionaries planted this church. Uh, American hippies from the seventies Jesus movement, and. Um, this is my second introduction to all things wrong with Christianity. I had never heard these songs. I had never sat in a worship. I had never been in a worship situation. I've never really heard worship music. Um, I had heard, you know, I had. I wish we'd all been ready by Larry Norman. I remember that when I was a kid. You know, I was on the radio. But um, this was a foreign. I had never experienced this before, and I was appalled that I knew how the song went. I knew all the chord progressions before they even happened, and I thought to myself, really, is this all your God has? You know, the king, you know, it was, it was the most, it was lame, it was rudimentary, and it had absolutely no thought to it, the music. I was very turned off by it. I was like, wow, this is really lame. I'm in a band. I, 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 I do this. You know, uh, it was lame, and I listened to some of the best music ever made by humans. And this was, and this, and these are Christians. They represent this God of theirs. That's supposed to be the one true God. And if this is the expression of, if this is all this God God has, as far as a, uh, it was just really bad, really bad. It took, that would that would plague me for for years, years and years and years and years. I would have to learn to to compartmentalize the fact that music by Christians was so bad. I, I would have to learn how to deal with that because it was it was a massive trigger for me, triggering thing for me. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that was really not that was that would be my a really big deal for me as a musician um, finding out that Christians did not do music. Um, the the guy preached. I didn't need a translator because he's preaching in English. I remember one thing he said. I don't know why I remember it. Oh, I do. I do because it's part of my faith profile. But I remember one thing he said, and that was in order for healing to accomplish to be accomplished, you as the person healing the other person, there has to be compassion. You're you're like you're like. Uh, a conduit for God's spirit, for God's essence, for God's, you're, you're a conduit for God. You're a representing God. And there has to be compassion on your behalf on this other human being for healing. I remember him saying that. I don't know why, but I did. And then they lined up all these Guatemalans, these little Guatemalan Indian people, because there was a lot of uh, indigenous people and, you know, that don't even speak Spanish. They speak Quiche or Cachiquel or something like that, some Mayan dialect. I would find out later. I don't know what they're doing there at this point. I just see these people in this native, you know, this clothing, uh, Guatemalan textiles, and 
people are lining up, they're being prayed for, and then there's, there's testimonies of blind eyes seen and withered hands now healed and all that. And so this is going on, this is happening, and my uncle comes up to me and he says, so what do you think about, what do you think about all this? Again, if there's a bad, there's got to be a good. If there's a negative, there's got to be a positive. If there's evil, there's got to be good. And if there's a, and if there's really a God, if if this God was the, with, if the God Jesus God, if that guy's real, then it, then there there has to he has to be able to heal humans, he, right? This has to be able to happen. So even though I'm a non-believer, I'm not stupid. If there is this thing called God, if that's a real thing. This should be able to happen. So I'm not surprised for it by it at all. And I told him, I'm like, yeah, man, that's pretty cool. And he goes, and he, uh, you know, but I also was, you know, off, you know, off the cuff, you know, yeah, hey, man, whatever floats your boat. This is your thing. This is not my thing. And then he looked right through me. He didn't look at me. He looked right through me and he goes, he goes, come on, man, you're, you're better. You're smarter than that. And he kind of like, sh- you know, does this with his hand, you know, look, look at what's going on here. And he goes, what do you have to lose? And I sat there for a second and I thought, holy moly, I've been, I, I, I've been completely discarded. I'm not wanted. My parents don't want me. My family have came up with this because, you know, I've been dealing with this for 72 hours. The reality that um, I've been uh, entirely, completely, screwed by my family and i remember calling back some of my friends in la going it's i was right they screwed me they they did this they really did this i was trying to figure out how i could get to england i had some friends in england some punk friends in england how, maybe i could go there obviously not wanted i, I can't i really can't go back where am i going am i going to go back to burbank that, that's that's <laughs> and i sat there and i thought wow I might, you know my my family has just thrown me away. They they don't want nothing to do with me. I'm 15 years old, um, and they lied and they threw me on a one way ticket. I mean, I'm screwed. I'm stuck. I don't have any money. I'm 15 years old. I can't even work here. You know, it's like it's like it's like uh, what what what's what's that reality TV show? Locked up abroad. <laughs> you know, I'm in a third world country. I don't even know the language. I've got nothing to lose. I've already lost everything. And he goes, you want to pray? I'm like, yeah, all right. I mean, <laughs> why the hell not? He, um, he said, all right, I'll be right back. <laughs> I don't know why he didn't pray for me. I'm glad he didn't. Um, but, well, it was he wasn't supposed to, but anyway. So he went and got somebody to pray for me, and um, and when he walked up, it took it was like, it, like I don't know ten fifteen minutes. I mean, it felt like a lifetime, because you know you can imagine my thought process during this time. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Should, you know, you, you know, the little angel, the little demon. Hey, okay, you, you're gonna pray, be prayed for now. Ah, don't let him pray for you. Don't let him touch you. These people, you know, I mean, this whole thing is going on in my head. You know, as I sat there quietly, I'm real. I, I mean. I'm really at a loss. I am. I am. I, I've never had. I, I haven't. I never felt, nor have I ever felt, that alone, that discarded. That, I mean, it was not a good feeling. I don't. I don't suggest to any of you. It's not. It was. It was bad. I mean, one. I'm a kid. Two. I'm, I know I'm with family, but I don't know these people. I don't know these people at all. I don't know anything about their God, their lives. I'm in a foreign country. I don't know the language. It's like, I was scared. I was scared and alone, man. And now I'm getting now. Now I'm, you know, and it's 72 hours is not, is not a long time. <laughs> That's not a long time. And now I'm going to like, and I'm at this church. I'm in a church. It was so foreign. Everything was so foreign. It was terrifying. And now I'm going to pray, whatever the hell that means. 
whatever that means. And it was, and it, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. It took a long time for this, for this guy to show up to pay for me. And I was going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It was, it was, it was, it was not, it was not very, it was, I was very uncomfortable. And uh, the guy that ends up showing up uh, is a guy that I had met before a few, a couple, two or three years ago when my uncle came through town one time. Um, who had engaged, you know, I jumped in my, I was in all my glory, my full face makeup. You know, I, you don't know if I'm a boy or a girl. I don't, you don't, you can, I don't, what do I, I the way I look, it, it, I could, I could have been, I could have passed for either. The way I used to look, the way I used to dress, makeup, the way I carried myself, it was all, that whole androgynous shock tactic. I was heterosexual, but it was all about, you know, this, the crazy Bowie, I was a Bowie kid. Nowadays they'd try to get me to uh, uh, what's it called? They would have nowadays they, they they actually will try and transition. They would I would I would have been a prime candidate for these dumbasses to try and transition me because I was the the, the demographic. Um, and I jumped into this my I needed a ride to a rehearsal, and my uncle said he all right oh yeah get, jump in the van in the van and i jumped in the van and there was, a, there was like a 15 passenger van full of like young and up and coming prophets uh, you know all these major you know god guys and i i jumped in that van and they they freaked out man i don't even know what it's like they had never seen anything like this before i can only imagine how many demons they discerned just jumped into the van and I'm like, what's up? <laughs> and I'm like their leader's nephew. And this one guy was like, hey, have a seat. Moved over, gave me a place to seat, and started engaging me in conversation. Frank Francisco Bianchi. He's an aristocrat. And he's now standing before me with his wife, and he's arguing with his wife. That's what had taken so long for them to get to me. They were in an argument. They were fighting. He's, he's talking to her in English, and she's blabbering in Spanish. I don't know Spanish. And he's a highly animated guy. And so he, he would like, no, he was scolding his wife in English. No, Molly, you got to tell him. You got to tell him. And then he turned around at me all animated. Molly got a word from the Holy Spirit for you in English. And she doesn't speak English. And I'm like, I don't know what, I don't understand anything you just said. What do you mean got a word? I don't know what that means. What do you mean got a word from the Holy Spirit? I don't, I have no reference. How how stupid do I look? She doesn't speak. She she got it. She got this word in English, and she doesn't speak English. Uh, I mean, you might think I was stupid because I let my family con me. No, I knew they were conning me, but I knew I had to get on that plane. It was a it was bigger than me. Now they're trying to con me that this woman doesn't speak English, and she got a and she got this thing called a word from the Holy Spirit in English. And she doesn't speak English. I have no idea what's going on, and they're arguing. And he's like, no, you got to tell him. You got the word in England. You got to tell him, Molly. You got to tell him. You know, and she's like, and so anyway, like, she finally consent. She finally gave up. She looked at me deep side, looked at him with a, with, I'm going to get, I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later type of look, you know. And I just remember this elegant woman. She's still, I, I'm, I'm still in contact with her. He's, he's died though the last few years ago. But, uh, this elegant woman gets down on one knee. Hold, takes my hands into her hands, looks me in the eye, and the only thing I remember her saying, the only thing I remember from this word, I wish I had it right, was Jesus loves you, and then, and then that's all I remember. And then she said, don't resist him. Because that's, you know, and that, that just, and then Frank prayed for me. She left, pissed, and uh, Frank prayed for me. And, um, I remember praying. I don't know what the prayer was. You know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like a zombie going through emotions at this point. But I remember when I finished praying, opening up my eyes and lifting up my head, and going like that because everything was brighter. My eye, something physically happened to my eyes. Everything was brighter. Colors were more vibrant. Uh, something something happened and i was like obviously i looked bewildered or afraid because he because frank looking i go frank frank 
something's happened to my eyes. And he's like, Christianese, oh, you know, that I'm like, no, no, because I have no reference to Christianese. And I go, no, no, no. Something has physically has happened to my eyes, to my sight. So he, he got a little worried. Oh, shoot. <laughs> what, what did I do? Prayed for this guy, and now he can't see. And um, I go, no, no. And then I, and I literally went like this. It's as if there has been a mesh lining over my eyes that's now gone. I knew nothing about Paul. I knew nothing about scales. I had no reference for anything. So obviously, uh, to my surprise when I found when I got to the point in Acts where scales came off Paul's eyes, and I was like, "But I explained it like that to 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 Frank that something had come." Boom. He was like, "Oh." So, forty-four years ago today, I met my first Christian mentor, who I am. This new music program this new music project I'm doing, uh, audio, um, auditory, I'm actually covering, his name's Ken Sabella, I'm actually covering one of his songs that he wrote in 1973 called Windows. It's one of my favorite songs he ever wrote. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. I'm actually covering it. I'm actually doing it. Uh, we you know, his permission and the whole thing, you know, he knows I'm going to do it. Um, so I met my first mentor when it came to Christian music 44 years ago today. I met my wife Right, right before lunch, and I met Jesus. God, we just thank you for the power of testimony and for hearing this sweet, sweet story. Thank you that I think it's Psalm 139 says, you see us in the womb and all our days are planned and you fulfill your purpose for us. And I just thank you for this testimony and this, this blessing and the blessing I have of knowing Alan. And I just ask for this testimony to go forth for everyone listening who have themselves not yet submitted to Jesus or have family and friends they're praying for, that this would encourage hope and faith that even in the darkness and the ups and downs and the lies and the deception and the sin, your way finds a way to snatch those from the fire. And you can redeem the lost and you can work in a way that we could not conjure or force or create. And we just thank you for your mercies. And we thank you for your love. And we thank you that you are a God of suddenly and can step in and, and change someone in, in a day in less than a week. That's going one road and then it's a complete 180. We praise, praise you for this blessing, Lord. We pray, pray, praise you for Alan's life. And I just ask for even more fruit for Alan and his territory and his family, Lord, this year that you would release more favor. You would, you would continue like it, like if this is the, all these years 
40 years, Alan, 44. That, that would be the first chapter, Lord, that your exponential favor and blessing for the coming year and the coming years would be even more. And he'd be weeping in five years from now, telling the story from now until then. Bless your name, Father. It's just overwhelming that he would love me. You know, he calls you by name and he he draws you unto himself. The fact that he would um, bother with, that he would do that. It's still, it's still overwhelming to me. And, um, and the fact that I responded correctly to that. So, cause we all know that's not a lot of it. And the fact that you know, he has still kept me after all these years. It's still very overwhelming and very... Uh, Think about what was set in motion of those, your family members that didn't even know him. Well, and what really spoke to me is he goes, I elected Alan. I elected Alan. And he was not going to get away from me. And I know we have a choice, but he's the hound of heaven. Yeah. And the reality was he plucked you out. He elected you because he foreordained it. Those are the kind of things we have. There's no way to explain that except that he knew you before you were in your mother's womb. And when you think about something like that, how much he loves you and how much he loves us, yeah. I guarantee you there's someone watching this today. And I was thinking about this. That's going to hear this. That can't even believe that a God loves them. And they're going to hear it, whether it's the people online that are going to share it with somebody but I guarantee you somebody's going to get this because that's the way God works. Be, we can't even f fathom what's just gone out into the airways and even what was shared this day, how it breaks the power of the enemy. That's how powerful testimony is. But the reality is, is that you were elected. And I'm going, wow. When you think about that. I know. That's what breaks me because it's like. He's faithful. Who the hell am I? <laughs> Just some dumb kid. You met your wife. You everything that, that happened to you that day. That day, my 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 whole life changed one day. The, all the pieces, you know, being a, a, a sanctified musician to you know Christina and the pieces. So it's it's overwhelming. Uh, and. And Christine and I talk a lot about all the people that we've known in these 40 years and how the majority of them have been lost or have walked away and have absolutely grateful and humbled and feel to be, to have, for him to have kept us all these years from, you know, walking away or from being sidetracked or broadsided or, you know, whatever. You know, it talks about you know people. People have a problem with you know if when they when I if I say something like no man, I still believe the same thing I freaking believed forty years ago. Oh well, then you haven't grown, you haven't progressed. It's like you, you literally have no idea what you're talking about. Isaiah and Jeremiah say that we need to stay with stay to the ancient paths, stick to the ancient paths, and that they're calling it ancient back then. You know, we've got to keep to to the absolutes of the word of God, no matter how long you go. Because see, there's no, no, there's no shadow of turning in. He doesn't change. His spirit doesn't change with the times. His, uh, his, 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 he, there's no shadow of turning in him. His doctrine doesn't change. His spirit doesn't change. Crazy. 
So that happened to me 44 years ago today, and it's just as real today as it was then. Yeah. It's actually more real today than it was back then. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for his uh, salvation, his deliverance for his care in my life you know i know i know you know that chris because i know you are too he's a good god good abba he's a good abba And it's awesome that we get to share it with you guys, you know, that we're, you know, that God has put together this group of people that uh, we get to, to, to walk, walk with. <laughs> Even if it's somewhat virtual. That's why you should come to our conference <laughs> and meet everyone. And, uh, we can phys physically gather. What's up with you, Chris? What's up, Lenny? How you guys doing? Good. I want to share what happened to me today. That's my testimony, little testimony. That was powerful. It was, I was riveted. I never heard three quarters of that. Seriously? No. That's no. I never heard the depth of how, what you were going through emotionally when your parents sent you down there. Never What's heard up? that. That's so, powerful. I remember when Corn turned 15, I posted a blog saying, you know, there's nothing you could ever do, Corin. <laughs> that would make us ship you away, you know. My parents didn't know what to do, and I understand that. I mean, they, they were beside themselves. They literally had no constant, no clue what to do. That's proven by what they did to me. And how my siblings came out. They did not know what to do. They had, they were not, they didn't know how to parent, obviously. And um, so, you know, you can't, you can't fault. I mean, you can, but what am I going to do? Hold a resentment and a grudge? It changed my life. It was for the best. God's hand was in it. <clears throat> they were just, that's just how it worked out. So to, you know, to a, a very small fraction, I can identify with Joseph, a little, little fraction, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's. Oof. And my, I got to see my father come to the Lord years, you know, a handful of years before he died. That, that was awesome, man. That was amazing. This, the Jesus thing is real. I'm sticking to it. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I don't care what all you people say or do. I will stand alone on this mountain and I will proclaim the goodness of the Lord to the assembly. So that was 1976. Is that what we're saying? No, 1980. Yeah, right. January 80. of 80. Yeah. A little kid. I actually have photos of me at the airport. I dig them up, but I have photos of me when I got on that plane. Little kid. In three years, Shonda would be born. No. Six. Was that 84? She was born in 86. 86, right. Yeah. Okay. So I met Christina in Two 80. Years. There's a picture of us that we have of us together. Somebody goes, hey, let me take a picture of you guys. It's for, I guess, the yearbook or whatever. And we're like all awkward standing next to each other. <laughs> We have that June 1980. We have that photo. Okay, 1980. Right. We started. We 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 became boyfriend girlfriend in 82. 
then I left and went to Nicaragua and Ecuador, and I went to the States, and then she showed back up in the States. We started living together in 85, and then Sean oh, okay. was born in 86. Got it. was born in 88. You married us in 88. Right. I met you in 86. Yeah, 86, 87, yeah. I remember coming over to your house. You were a skinny little guy, man. I was a skinny little guy, man. It was like heroin skinny, but I didn't do heroin. <laughs> Julian's like that too. He's really skinny. Yeah, I was. I was really skinny, crazy skinny, rock and roll skinny. Hey, you gotta, you gotta be skinny when you sing in a band. Or you should. We need it. We need to hear Christina's side of the story of yeah. how she she got there, and then her first impressions and walking down the hall and moving yeah. to LA. It's probably not going to be nearly as romantic as mine. <laughs> Oh, uh, he says that, before. but that. Hey, Christina. I don't, know, I don't know where she is. I think she went down the mountain. Oh yeah, yeah. I'd love, yeah, I don't know if I've ever. I don't know if I've ever heard her side. I mean, I'm sure I have, but yeah, we should ask her. What was it like? She says she remembers seeing me smoking in the, in the park. When she drove by that day. That's so weird. Gosh, it was so long ago. It's so vivid. It's those anchors of faith. That's what I call that, what you just shared, that nothing can touch you, that makes you stand for what's coming and what we know is what he's made us for. Those are the kind of things that said, okay, I'm yours, Lord. Spend me any way you want. Yep. Absolutely. No, it's like Yeah, it's. I mean, he made himself real the night I got saved, but he's made himself real multiple times since then. But it has. But I also understand that it's alignment. You have to align yourself with it. You know, if you're out in the freaking sticks, sacrificing to the goat gods, what was that? <laughs> you remember that? If you're doing that, you're probably uh, yeah. If you're, out in the, in the, if you're out in the sticks sacrificing to goat demons, you're probably going to miss them. Don't do that. I mean, I know not everybody had a conversion experience like that where there was an intersection, supernatural intersection. I understand that. But I needed but but at the same time, not everybody was as lost as I was at such an early age. I mean, I'm looking at my first secular big move in the secular music market of Los Angeles in the 70s. That's not normal. You line up as many people. I mean, you can, how many people do you know that's part of their testimony? I still haven't met very many that can say that. That's how drastic my conversion rate is going to be or whatever because it's like, you know what I'm saying? You know, Jesus walks is walk take Jesus is, is walking along the, the shores of the Galilee and he sees these fishermen and he goes, Hey, follow me. You know, that's different than Paul and what happened to him. But these guys also weren't high end Pharisees wiping out Christians. Paul was. So that conversion had experience had to be a little bit more traumatic. Yeah. So I Definitely. you know I, I can relate to like the when you see the chosen, those guys, their conversion was a process. Yeah. And you got to realize three years walking when Peter pulled those fish out of the, uh, the boat, that was a, a, a marker. But then when he saw the risen Messiah yeah. that day and he swam, you knew at that time he was saying, there's no going back. Yeah. You know, and, for me, that's how it was. It was there were points along the way he revealed himself, and I go, "Oh my gosh, I can't do what I was doing before." Yeah, yours was an all boom. Yeah, but but I mean, but but here's the other side of the coin. That conversion testimony has to be backed up or followed by uh, a, 
a more scrutinized walk. Is that, yep. Does that sound arrogant? I'm not trying to sound arrogant. No, but not at all. Not at all. What did Paul say? Based on what you've been given, you've got to. That's right. Paul laid himself out to say, Flamey, you better take a look at me right here, right now. He goes, because this is what happened to me. But yeah. what I'm saying is true. Yeah. So it it's not me. arrogant at all. Yeah, it happened to me. I didn't go and do it. <laughs> right. Right. It happened to you. I was. I, I enjoyed, uh, you know, I, I, I lived the life that I lived because I enjoyed it. I, I, you know, the, I was an actor. I sang in bands, you know, the sex, drugs, rock and roll. I mean, that, there was this whole thing I was involved with that I enjoyed, that I, that I had been pursuing my whole life. And God spared me. Because there's only one end to that lifestyle. <laughs> it's not good. It's not like, oh, yeah, no. The end of that way is death. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that, would, that would suck. Dying out, out of the Lord, dying outside of the Lord, dying without, without being in the Lord. Oh, my God. <sighs> Could you imagine the last 40 years of your life not being in Jesus? Oh, my God. That would be absolutely horrifying and horrific. There's no alternative, man. You can't. Well, well what about the alternative? The, there, that, that's not. What kind of an alternative? That's not an alternative. No. I'm forever grateful that I got on that plane. I'm forever grateful that I responded correctly to his call in my life that I didn't even know I was being called. I had no reference. I'm so I'm so grateful for that. I mean, my wife and I are always looking at each other and just going, man, because God's good. God is so good. God is so good. You've got to fan that flame. You've got to keep that thing alive. You've got to walk in alignment. You've got to pick up your cross. You've got to do the work of submission. You have to do the work of servant. You have to do the work of a servant to become a friend. You know, it's not a hands-off thing. I know that's what they taught you, but they they lied to you. And they told you that because they don't know themselves because they weren't taught that. They don't know. They can't teach you the truth because they've never been taught the truth themselves. You have to proactively be engaged in and with this thing God, the Holy Spirit, you have to have this incredibly extreme interactive relationship with the Holy Spirit in order for your life, in order for you to even begin the transformative process. You have to be a willing agent in the relationship to allow Holy Spirit to transform you from light to dark, life to death, truth, you know, from falsehood to truth. That's not something that just He's not going to just do that to you. I had to get on a plane even though I knew I was being conned. And this is why I'm so intense about this because it's real. It's life or death. It's absolutely changed my life. This is why I'm so intense about it. That's why I'm so aggressive about it. I'm so aggro about it. It's real, man. It's not a passive little doily <laughs> that you get at your Christian bookstore. This is this is real stuff, man, and it's it's spiritual. There's a lot of stuff going on. You know, there's a there's a lot of pieces, a lot of moving parts that we don't know about that we need to be con cognizant of to be able to put the pieces together take the steps, walk, be in alignment, have our heart, mind, spirit, all, you know, fire, firing on all cylinders for God's will and saying no to the evil, saying no to your flesh, saying no to the lust of your flesh, choosing holiness, choosing to be set apart. Man, it's so, it's so worth it.
sticking to it. I'm sticking to that story, man. And if I'm wrong, okay. All right. Well, that took longer than I thought it would. I didn't know I, didn't know I was gonna mon monopolize the whole the whole session. It was well worth it to hear all that. Yeah, that's. And then a few years later, he would put me into your life, Lenny. He'd bring us I together. I know. I'll never forget that. Yeah. And we're just edging our way up. Just it was an interesting time because there was still some remnants of the Jesus movement going on, and yet the prophetic was about ready to hit. Yeah. It was about ready to explode, and no one was ready for it. They thought they were, <laughs> but it hit the church big time. And it hit Charismatica. It really did. Yeah. And uh, I, I look back now and I look at a lot of the people at the Burbank Vineyard and I look at all of them. I'm going, how many of us are still standing? <laughs> I know. It's and sad. what people, it's, it's not, in all three or four churches that I've been part of, how many are still standing? That's what's scary. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's interesting, too, because I'm thinking about it. I was thinking about some other things the other night. I was talking to my niece. She's over at Reading, and she's really excited about all the things she's received. But I asked her this. I go, how much have you fallen in love with Jesus through his word? And she goes, well, what do you mean by that? I go, is his word, does it blossom in you? Does it become life when you hear what he says about you? Or what are you hearing? Are you hearing how just to get by? And she goes, you know, I never thought about that. I go, I think the next part of your journey is the living word becoming alive in you to explode. Because that's when you become obedient to say, you know what? I want to honor Sabbath. I want to honor everything about him that he says to be obedient to the T, not just to get results and make it through every day. And I, I don't know if it, one of the reasons I say that because she was saying, oh, I love all the sermons. They just keep me going and all this. And I'm going, something's missing. And uh, I had to speak into her life. And this brings me back to your testimony you had an encounter with the living God at a point where from the get-go, not that you didn't have to grow and learn and do all this other stuff, he got a hold of you. Yeah. And uh, um, what I was able just to speak into her, I'm going, you know what? She has a journey still yet. There's some discovery she has, you know, and she's walking with the Lord. She loves the Lord. She was just down in South America. She was with all them and right, right where, she, where Jondell was down there and everything. But there's this place where I know I, I'm praying, I'm okay, God, you need to connect with her in this place, you know. And, and that I was just looking back at that and I'm going, what you shared, there's that connectivity that you want that right now with Jesus. You know, that's what makes me want to go away and just, I'm so thankful that I have that. I want to be obedient today. I want to live today. Uh, it, it is no joke. It's no joke. And, and that's all I've ever wanted is for others to have the same weighty experience in their life. Right. And it's sad because so many people make these really lame-ass excuses on why 
they don't or can't or won't, you know, or don't have it. You know, it's like it's it's like the idea of you have to give up your life. It, it's lost on them. You know? Yep. But they still want it, and then they get resentful that they don't whatever. But you know. They don't put in the. They don't put in the effort. They don't put in the work. They don't die. They don't. They. They. They're, they're still holding on to so much of their, whatever. It's, so that's aggravating. But, but that's all. You know, that's all I've ever. You know. Oh wow! Look at this cool thing happening. I, I, I mean, I'd like to tell you about. It. It's called the good news. <laughs> you know, right? I remember that I found a campaign. We had that in Guatemala. Ya lo encontré. I found it. You know, I, I, there's this good news. There's this thing that you might not know about. Or there's this depth of this thing you know about, you know, to Christians. You know? I think it's cool. I think it's cool enough to share. I think it's cool enough to share about. I, 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 I know it's real. It's happened to me. I've seen it. And... And if it's and it says that he desires for all men to come to the full knowledge, I mean, he wants this. He he's willing, but so many of us are not. That's that's a shame, you know. You want to close this out, Chris? Chris, what, what do you got for us? Yeah, when you're talking, I was just thinking of the the suddenly the word god of god of suddenly anytime any place anywhere whatever he wants to do or how he wants to manifest or move mountains part seas uh um um what he binds the fruit of the fig tree like just i'm just humbled by your testimony and yeah. reminded of his power and that's the god we serve we're under his wings let's stay there Amen. Why, why would we ever want to go anywhere else? He saved you from the dominion of darkness and brought you into his kingdom of light. Yeah. You were you were probably on a path to death within years. Yeah, I believe so. Or even if you survived breathing a life of sabotage and destruction. And he yeah. snatched you out of that for a purpose. And it's been revealed and it's still being revealed. And it's awesome. Yeah, I know that. I know that to be true. Yeah. It only adds to the gratefulness, you know? Mm -hmm. The humbling gratefulness of his mercy and grace. You know, a lot of people are like, Alan, you're all about the law. You don't, you don't believe in mercy and grace. It's like, my life is a testimony of his mercy and grace. Amen. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, we God, go. look, look, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. You know, should I pray? Close this yeah. out? Is that, sure. Okay. Lord, we honor you. We are thankful. We are thankful that you have redeemed us and taken us from the kingdom of darkness into your light. Yes, Father. Pray that you move mightily on within the sound of my voice on those people that have yet to be come into your kingdom call them bring them force them whatever you need to do get them on that plane to, to move mountains that will be for their blessing and their joy and their shalom their peace god we love you we praise you i got i have no other words than song of ascent than than you are just high and holy and your name is greater than every name and we love you you are the source of our life you are the source of our favor and our blessing release it upon us lord may the favor of the lord our god be upon us yes let his hand rest upon us we love you amen
You're listening to Chameleon Church. Biblical antidotes for the modern man. With your host, Alan Aguirre. The views and opinions expressed during our broadcasts are solely those of the broadcast producers, hosts, and or guests, etc., and are not necessarily the views or opinions of the Travelog Network, its sponsors, or affiliates.